Okay. Um, thank you for attending History and Historians in response to COVID-19, Infection and Inequality, which part, is part of the AHA colloquium series of Virtual AHA. We're excited to have you all join us and are looking forward to a productive discussion. I would like to thank our generous sponsors, the National Endowment for the Humanities, the Stanton Foundation, the History Channel, and Oxford University Press. I would also like to draw attention to an AHA resource that might be of interest, a bibliography of historians' responses to COVID-19, which is also supported by an NEH CARES grant. We'll post a link to that resource in the chat. You can support virtual AHA and other AHA activities by joining the AHA, or if you're already a member, making a donation today. We'll post links with details in the chat at the end of the meeting. Finally, a few logistical things to consider before we start the webinar. By registering or participating in the AHA's webinars, participants and panelists agree to abide by the rules of AHA's Code of Professional Conduct. Um, all participants will be muted, but you can use the Q&A function to submit questions to the presenters. We hope to address all relevant questions, but also need to be mindful of the time, so we may paraphrase or combine questions. If you'd like to be part of the conversation on social media, remember to use the virtual AHA hashtag. Finally, a quick reminder that this webinar is being recorded and we will share the recording on YouTube soon. I'll now turn this over to the chair of our webinar, Evelyn Hammond. Thank you. Good afternoon. Um, welcome to uh, this discussion of infection and inequality. We have a, a marvelous group of historians uh, with us today. Uh, but first I wanna recognize that one who was scheduled to be with us, Maria John was uh, called away due to a death in the family and we want to extend our sympathies to her. Uh, we will begin today uh, looking at uh, the ways in which inequality, inequality, excuse me, contributes to and can be reinforced by infectious disease. And the scholars we have with us today know a great deal about those processes, both uh, historically and contemporaneously. Uh, we have, uh, in order of their speaking, we have Alan Kraut from New York University. American Sam University. I'm sorry. <laughs> American University. It's all right. I looked at my notes and that's exactly what I wrote down. And, that, and then I said New York. <laughs> I am a New Yorker though. <laughs> okay. Sam Roberts from Columbia University, uh, Keith Waylu from Princeton, and uh, Mike Spence from uh, the University of Washington. And the way we'll proceed is to have each speaker talk for about 10 minutes, and then the rest of the panel will ask some questions, and we'll move through the group, and at the end, we'll open up for Q&A with the audience. So uh, thank you for your attention. And uh, I think we can get started. And Alan, would you please begin? Thank you. Thank you, Evelyn. Um, in the past months, we've heard the President of the United States refer to the novel coronavirus or COVID-19 as Chinese virus or Wuhan flu. Shocked, many of us have watched television, television news footage of an Asian woman wearing a surgical mask being brutally beaten in the New York City subway by someone who clearly seems to be punishing her personally for the coronavirus. Whether or not the president's characterization of COVID-19 contributed to this and other violent anti-Asian outbursts, I think there can be little doubt that the current administration has found in the pandemic a public health rationale to further its agenda of immigration restriction. The technique deployed is to claim that the legislation of an earlier era intended to protect public health was actually, in fact, intended to restrict immigration and even uh, as a basis for deporting some newcomers. Let me offer some perspective on uh, the current policy and then some historical perspective. In the early 1890s, cholera epidemics swept across Europe and reached America's shores. In 1892, President Benjamin Harrison suspended immigration to the United States for 20 days to protect Americans from the disease. But he did not extend the period in an effort at broader immigration control. That was never his intent. A year later, in 1893, Congress passed the National Quarantine Act. 
The act was not intended to restrict immigration as a cholera preventive. Instead, the act specified national regulations of medical inspection and disinfection for ships and immigrants to be administered by the US Marine Hospital Service, which of course is today's public health service. The regulations that supported the act established protocols for medical inspection, ship sanitation, and required more specific medical documentation of the shipping lines before ships departed for the United States. In the event of a pending epidemic, the act authorized the Surgeon General to suspend introduction of persons or goods into the United States on public health grounds. President Harrison signed the bill in February of 1893, but he never attempted to use the legislation to curb immigration or to deport people who were already here, merely to prevent infection from entering the United States. Only ship companies suffered penalties, not individuals. As historian Howard Markell has observed, the National Quarantine Act of 1893 might be best seen as a vital brick among many along the road the federal government continued to build during the 20th century in its assumption of public health responsibilities, end quote. It increased the power of public health experts, that's clear, but not immigration restrictionists. The Public Health Service Act of 1944 echoed the 1893 legislation, and the intent of the law was to prevent arrivals already diagnosed with a disease or a cargo believed to be contaminated from entering the country. The law was never intended to be an instrument of immigration restriction or deportation. But the current occupants of the White House refer to the 1944 law in claiming public health necessity for such things as suspending hearings on asylum claims and in other ways st stalling the arrival of immigrants, refugees, and asylees. Court cases brought by the ACLU this past summer sought to challenge this delay or denial of hearings in a timely manner. The hunt for public health justification for immigration restriction is in many ways old wine in new bottles. Throughout American history, nativists have argued that the physical well being of Americans, especially their safety from epidemic disease, is dependent upon immigration restriction, or what I've called in my work a double helix of health and fear that has resulted in the stigmatization of the foreign born as carriers of disease to America's shores, and too often has been used as justification for discrimination and even persecution. There are lots of examples of this medicalization of prejudice. Uh, in 1832, the cholera epidemic that swept the East Coast was blamed on Irish Catholic immigrants coming by the tens of thousands. It reinforced anti-Catholic sentiments fueled by the Protestant evangelists of the Second Great Awakening. Government's response to illness from abroad in this period was at the state level, not federal. It was the states that controlled immigration, not the federal government. Indeed, in New York and in other coastal uh, states, there were emigration depots that were established by the state. In New York, it's the Castle Garden facility at the very tip of the battery. Uh, between the 1880s and the 1920s, 23 and a half million newcomers arrived in the US, mostly from Southern and Eastern Europe, but also from China and Japan and parts of Latin America. Fearing that the states were not up to either the quarantine or inspection and interrogation responsibilities, the federal government gradually moved quarantine responsibilities from the states to the federal government and in an 1891 law provided for the inspection of individual immigrants uh, by the federal government at uh, the various facilities like Ellis Island uh, in New York or Angel Island on the West Coast. During this era, the stigmatization of newcomers for particular diseases was rampant. In 1882, Congress passed the Chinese Exclusion Act 
dramatically curbing Chinese migration to the United States. The cases of bubonic plague that surfaced in San Francisco in 1900 were blamed on the Chinese who were already in the United States. And all of Chinatown was quarantined. And many citizens in California actually wanted to torch it and simply burn it down. Uh, there were other such episodes. The polio epidemic of 1916 that ravaged the East Coast was blamed on Southern Italian laborers. The prevalence of tuberculosis, which while not an ap epidemic in the formal sense, was blamed on Eastern European Jews. TB was sometimes called the Taylor's disease or the Jewish disease. Anti-Semitic nativists often pointed to the inferiority of the Jewish body as an argument against assimilation. One such nativist, E.A. Ross, who is a professor of sociology at the University of Wisconsin, wrote in 1914, on the physical side, the Hebrews are the polar opposite of our pioneer breed. Others charged the Jews were inherently tubercular. The most deadly epidemic of the early 20th century was, of course, the 1918 influenza pandemic. The influenza virus responsible for the pandemic killed an estimated 20 million and perhaps as many as 100 million people worldwide. In the US, uh, about 550,000 died, um, an estimate that was derived from reporting that was at best incomplete and uneven. And unlike other epidemics, this one took the lives of many young adults. Um, between 29 and 34 years of age. But one of the interesting things about this pandemic is that it wasn't blamed on one particular group. So many people got it. So many people were sick. Uh, and indeed there were, because it was in the middle of World War I, there were so many immigrants who were serving in the military that this pandemic was not the occasion for the stigmatization that often occurred. And that in and of itself is fascinating. Uh, rather, um, it was simply something that everyone was suffering and no one was particularly blamed for it. Um, interestingly enough, a few years later, when Congress debated immigration restriction in the 1920s, throughout the debates, there were many reasons given for limiting the number of newcomers coming to this country. Uh, the Southern Italians, the Eastern European Jews, the Greeks, the Russians, uh, the Chinese, the Japanese. Uh, but the health issue was never raised. Interestingly enough, and one last uh, anecdote, uh, it was raised with respect to Haitians and AIDS, HIV AIDS, in the early 1980s. Some of you will remember that it was described as the disease of the four H's, Haitians, homosexuals, hemophiliacs, and heroin users. Why Haitians? Well, because in 1983, an error at the CDC caused Haitians to be classified as a high risk group for AIDS, a designation that was withdrawn two years later in 1985, but not before Haitian families suffered the effects of the stigmatization. Mm -hmm. The episode was harmful, but unintentional. The current administration's linkage of public health and immigration restriction has been quite intentional. The COVID-19 pandemic is an ongoing drama and how the disease will affect immigration and the integration of newcomers into American society is very much a chapter that I think is still in progress. Thanks. Thank you, Alan. Um, we have time for a couple of questions from the panelists. Are we, I'm sorry, Evelyn, were we doing questions after each one or are we gonna do, uh, were we doing questions at the end of all of them? Well, we can so, do it either way, but uh, what, which, uh, why don't we wait? Say? Yeah. Why don't we wait? Okay, let's wait. All right, thank you. Uh, I'm, I'm, I'm easy in these kinds of things. Uh, and our next speaker will be uh, Sam Roberts. Yeah, and I'm, uh, thank you, Evelyn. I apologize for uh, flipping the script there, but I've been really okay. looking forward to, for months to having this conversation. So I wanna get us all 
spend okay. as much time as we can, all of us speaking. So I apologize for uh, taking a, a, a prerogative that wasn't um, given to me. It's really good to see all of you um, and to be here. Thank you so much um, to Lisa Brady, to Debbie Ann Doyle, to the staff of the AHA for their adjustments to this really trying time. Um, it's, uh, yeah, it's, it's, I've been looking forward to this, like I said, for a while, particularly because uh, Evelyn, Alan, uh, and Keith are, are scholars who influenced my work way back when, whom I've known for years and years. And it's, it's always good to see you. I'd hope that we'd be together in person. Uh, Michael, I'd hope that we would have met um, in person as well. And, uh, but, you know, it's, it's a pleasure anyway, and I'm not complaining. Um, but it's just, you know, I really hope to be in Seattle too. I've never even been to Seattle. I don't even know much about the city. What, what I know could be like put on a short list, to be honest with you, that would, you know, include like, you know, Ray Charles, Eddie Vedder, the Space Needle, Microsoft, and end with like, you know, I don't know what else, Fraser Crane, that's it. So I'm missing out on this, but it's still good, good to be here. Um, Those are all the reasons that I ended up in Seattle. Is that right? Well, I hope they didn't disappoint that. <laughs> so, but any case, um, you know, this is, uh, this is what it is. And, uh, and uh, I'm, you know, glad that uh, to, to be here. Um, there's something a little unsettling almost um, about speaking historically as a historian about, uh, about this no longer novel coronavirus. Um, it just seems almost, uh, it's defied, I, like, that's a pursuit that I think has defied a lot of us um, when, when we've been queried by journalists, by students, by colleagues, um, you know, how we actually wrap our minds around this. Um, and I think for me, it's in part because even after, you know, we're at the end of the year, in the last week of the year, I feel like I still have more questions than I have answers. Um, just to give you a bit about my background, uh, my specialization it lies at the intersection of public health and medical history um, STS, science, science, technology, and society studies, and in African American studies. <clears throat> I've written a bit about governmentality, racialization, and the modern public health state from the late 19th century to about the mid 20th. Uh, more recently, I've inter interested myself in histories of psychoactive substances, um, drug user subjectivities, both, both uh, political and social, or political and otherwise, um, HIV, and the uh, harm reduction movement. Uh, this current work mainly covers the 1950s to the 1990s. Uh, I, I bring this all up because the temporal shift wasn't easy, moving from that late 19th to the mid 20th century period, and then jumping to the post-war era. Um, you see, when you work in the pre-1940 period, and the scholars on this panel know this, but just for those in the audience who might not, um, when you work in that earlier period, infection is everywhere, right? I mean, people are dropping like flies from infection. Um, Infection was that which caused most deaths in any given year before 1930 or so. But after the 1930s, an increasing number of infectious diseases either could be prevented with vaccines or cured with antibiotics. This development, of course, was related both causally and incidentally to the growth of the post-war biomedical industrial complex fueled by hundreds of millions of dollars of public and private joint investment. The point, however, is that the social and cultural mainstream of this country between 1955 and 1985 or so, uh, wasn't really that concerned with infection. Um, it was a really different mindset, right? We had vanquished so many of these infectious diseases by the 1950s um, that we had really entered a different way of thinking about just bodily subjectivity and, and risk of infection. The new biomedical frontier, which was to say um, chronic diseases in particular, had been announced in the 1950s. Yes, to a certain degree, it is true that HIV in the 1980s ended that brief antimicrobial interregnum, as Joanne Brown once called it, but the human immunodeficiency virus might even prove my point. In many ways, HIV AIDS was, was always exceptional until it too took on the contours of a chronic disease to be prevented through prophylaxis or clinically managed through medical regimen. That's, that is, of course, if your circumstances afforded those to you. Those whose circumstances could not, however, lived and died as evidence of structural violence, a term which returned to vogue in medical anthropology and STS studies in the 1990s precisely because academic reactions to HIV and AIDS, or because of academic reactions to HIV and AIDS, including those written, of course, by Evelyn Hammonds here and others, um, 
you know, brought all this to light and made us think more deeply about uh, the, the um, HIV pandemic. I've always found interesting that Johann Galtung himself, when he first defined structural violence in 1969, inadvertently alluded to its bio and necropolitical aspects <clears throat> in using, <clears throat> excuse me, tuberculosis as an example. Galtung um, argued in defining structural violence, argued that the structural violence was a difference between one's potential and what was actual. If someone potentially could live to a certain age but did not, it might very well be because of structural violence, meaning that there was something societal that prevented that. Um, and uh, the, the, the example that he used was tuberculosis. Um, to die, he said, of tuberculosis in the 17th or 18th centuries was more or less just random bad luck. I am paraphrasing, by the way. Please, anybody in the chat or on Twitter, don't take me to task for getting that wrong. But that's the gist of what he said. To die a quarter, however, to die a quarter century after TB's chemotherapeutic cure um, had been developed and made widely available, i.e. in 1969 and early 1970s, um, that was structurally violent. I could quibble a bit with the accuracy of his statement, um, but as an illustration, I think its point holds. Uh, both the Black Panthers and the Young Lords, for example, ran community-based tuberculosis testing programs well aware of the health equity implications of tubercular infection in the early 1970s. Um, and Galtung uh, himself was quite prescient in regard to the return of infectious fear in the 1980s and 1990s, i.e. with HIV AIDS. For far too many people, the, uh, the ability to manage their condition, um, their HIV status that is, or even to prevent contracting the virus is mediated um, then and now very directly and forcefully by uh, what we would call structural determinants. And so here we are in 2020, faced with a new infection, <clears throat> trying to wrap our minds around it. And it might require another temporal shift of sorts in thinking. It's been a while since the threat of casual infection looms so large in the lives of so many. The vanquishing of so many infectious diseases and our embrace of chronic especially non-infectious disease as the next medical frontier to be conquered has had discernible effect on our conceptions of health. Um, for one thing, since the 1950s, we've come to think of many of the chronic and non-infectious diseases, which topped the list um, you know, until 2020, of course, which topped the list in the United States um, in terms of morb uh, morbid morbidity and mortality. Uh, many of these we've come to think of as uh, diseases of lifestyle, quote unquote a framing which, as Nancy Krieger and others have noted, puts the onus of health preservation on the individual. Lifestyle, quote unquote, um, after all is a choice, right? And when you think of many of the conditions predisposing COVID-19 victims towards severe morbidity and mortality, including hypertension, including diabetes, including cardiovascular disease, including asthma and obesity, remember that most of these, um, for most of the past six or seven decades, also have been um, put under that tent of diseases of lifestyle, diseases of choice. Indeed, that we have been able at all to describe these conditions in a frame of structural violence um, has been mainly because of the food justice and environmental justice movements of the late 20th um, century and beyond. Um, these gave us analyses, structural analyses at that, of nutritive want, of ambient particulate matter as impediments to lung function, of food deserts, et cetera, Etc. My unease in discussing COVID-19 therefore comes from our, meaning, you know, our, meaning societies, not the academies necessarily, our recent historical lack of vocabulary to think about disease, infectious or otherwise, um, it, or to think about in terms of equity, to be more specific. And we haven't done a very good job of seeing health and communities of color as being linked um, to justice. It hasn't been an easy year to have these discussions, given, for example, the elevated incidence among African Americans of the various predisposing conditions, one might have expected the CDC uh, to have issued an early warning directed at these communities. No such warning came. Instead, activist scholars and soon after Democratic Party uh, senators and representatives had to pressure state and federal officials uh, just to get ethnic data on infection and mortality. For morbidity, yeah, infection and mortality. In late June, over a thousand employees at the CDC, roughly 9% of all the employees there, signed an open letter decrying historic and ongoing racism 
with, within the agency, perhaps explaining why it had been blind to the potential dangers to communities of color in the first place. The deaths continued throughout the summer. Meanwhile, those of us closely watching the strains of, uh, or uh, watching strains of COVID denialism and anti-masking noted some unsettling patterns. Deeply embedded in some of the anti-mask protests was a kind of white privilege suburban ideology of rugged individualism, a refrain of quote, I don't ask anything from the state and the state can infringe on my personal liberties. It's a double falsehood, of course. Beginning in the 1940s, the state gave them their green lined suburbs, leaving the rest of us in red line center cities, which would be starved of resources after the 1970s. Kathy Cohen, of course, makes this argument when she talks about the onset of AIDS in black right. communities that the stage was set um, by these uh, public policy decisions. This was public policy, which set the stage for nearly all of the health inequities suffered by black Americans in the last quarter of the 20th century and beyond. I refer here to lead paint poisoning, to water quality problems, Flint being just the, the most dramatic, food scarcity, toxic exposures, HIV AIDS and substance abuse, or substance use rather, and the war on drugs. And One secondly, minute. of course, um, I'm sorry? One minute. Okay, yeah, I'm, I'm wrapping up. Um, and secondly, of course, uh, for more than 200 years, the government has had the right to compel health preserving behaviors under its police powers claimed by the public health. Uh, state. This was not really mentioned in our um, in our public discourse. In fact, what we did do was spend more time thinking about black distrust without even thinking about the roots of that. We had lots of Q and A and 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 polls about whether or not black people would trust the vaccine, without even thinking about why there is such black medical mistrust. Uh, we had uh, questions about you know, whether or not this would actually be something, you know, that people would sign up for in the clinical trials without actually telling us why it's important to have black people in clinical trials, leaving us with the assumption, of course, that it's about biological blackness and not about multiple exposures that we've had that might actually interfere with the efficacy of a vaccine. None of this was explained to us and it left this black box of race well intact, even as we tried to grapple our, or, you know, wrap our minds around what a COVID pandemic meant on a landscape that already was patently unequal. I don't really know what the answers are to this, but I know that we haven't asked some of the proper questions to even get to the historical roots, let alone the context of how we move forward. I've looked forward to this conversation for many months as I will to others moving forward, um, but certainly not as much as I look forward to getting that shot in my arm and hopefully being able to emerge above ground and see you all at our next meeting. So thank you very much. Thank you, Sam. Sorry about running late there, Evelyn. That's OK. Uh, now we turn to uh, Keith Whalen. Great, thanks. Um, I want to thank the AHA for putting this on, and uh, Alan and Sam for your comments, Evelyn for hosting, and Michael, I look forward to your comments as well. I'll just make uh, maybe five or six quick comments about um, what COVID-19 and the history of pandemics tells us about this intersection or the intersections between infection and inequality. And many of them have been anticipated by what Alan and Sam have already said. Um, the first is I would uh, call our attention to the what you might call the sociology of vulnerability, uh, which is a recurring feature of the landscape of epidemic. The, kinds of findings that show up in the newspapers, uh, in the public health data. Um, back in October, Wisconsin, a state with a population of 6.1 uh, African-Americans, 6.1% African-Americans, but Blacks uh, accounted for about 8.8% .8 of the COVID-19 cases and 17.7% of the deaths. Uh, in November, uh, the New York Times reported that uh, Latinx populations, American Indians and African Americans uh, had about four times the rate of hospitalization uh, as compared to white groups. And to their credit, the Times article pointed to the specific features of the sociology of vulnerability, that's not their phrase, that explain this difference, the fact that higher positivity rates 
were due to exposure in food service jobs, home healthcare work, essential labor in meat packing, meat processing facilities, uh, combined with the challenges of social distancing in congested neighborhoods uh, or in multi-generational households. And when you add all of these layers of vulnerability together, you get the kinds of disparities that we've seen. And so what I think is interesting is that this in many ways is a recurring story of epidemics and social calamity. Uh, for those who were sort of paying attention, which most of us were during Katrina, this was a kind of a, you know, a Katrina story of the sudden realization that there are these things called poverty and social disparities that disproportionately uh, leave its mark on one part of the population and over another. So, you know, you have the story of epidemics as revealers of gaps that already existed between, in our case, over the last 30 years, the, the widening gap between the haves and the have-nots, the well-to-do and the not-so-well-off. And so that's one of the features here, the sociology of vulnerability and the way in which um, epidemics of the past, and I'll talk a little bit about those in the past, have also revealed various kinds of structural systemic um, differences between uh, along the lines of class, poverty, race, age, and social location. Um, the second is to, to call attention to social class uh, and its intersection with race. Uh, this is in some ways foreshadowed a little bit by what Sam has said and certainly what Alan noted, right? That is to say all the way back in like 1665 London uh, in Daniel Defoe's uh, account of the plague, you have him observing the quote, the infection kept chiefly in the out parishes, which being very populous and fuller alas of poor, the distemper found more to prey upon than in the city. And here you have a different story, not the inner city, but the outer parishes being the social location of disproportionate plague mortality. Or 1830s, 1840s, New York City, the Irish Catholic of five points or the black citizens of the city seen as suffering greatly. One observer notes that these are the people who inherit the most pop, inhabit the most populous and central portions of the city. So, you know, what's interesting to me is this is a recurring pattern. You see it in the influenza pandemic, uh, 100 and two years ago, 202 to 101 years ago, uh, where you have some anecdotal information about higher rates among domestic workers. Certainly you had first outbreaks among on Navy vessels, not only because of the war, but also they're, they're kind of like, they remind us of the cruise ships that were at the, the very first you know, point of outbreak, the warning sign to us that COVID-19, the coronavirus was on its way. And so what you have here is an awareness, sometimes vaguely articulated, that there are these literal structural phenomena, social structural dynamics that explain the differences in infection rate and mortality. Uh, during cholera epidemics in the South, you'd have, or typhoid epidemics, you'd have comments about the Negro quarters of the plantation being adversely affected, or conversations about food handlers being uniquely vulnerable, or people who lived where contaminated water was more prevalent. These are very familiar stories in the history of public health that are structural explanations uh, for the differences uh, that intersect with race, they intersect with poverty. My third comment is that every organism ex creates a, a different kind of story about these inequalities in infections. Uh, they accentuate in infections, but slightly differently. Uh, it, it, they accentuate inequalities, but slightly differently. Um, and in the COVID-19 coronavirus story, what is particularly insidious is the asymptomatic spread. The, the story that was really only beginning to be 
clearly understood about a month or two months in that it is possible to both be infected by someone who appears to be well, but also to spread this infection when you appear to be well. This is a really, I mean, this is not so much of a reach, but it's kind of like the Typhoid Mary story, right? The Irish immigrant cook from a hundred years ago, who was an asymptomatic carrier without knowing, uh, well, after she did know, she continued to work, but she also became this kind of, you know, this topic of both curiosity and revile, um, a, a focal point of blame and ultimately incarceration in the name of protecting the public's health. So the asymptomatic spread of, of, of coronavirus is particularly insidious because in some ways what it highlights is that if you're a bus driver or if you work in a high rise or if you live in a multi-generational household or if you are a working in a meat processing plant, there's, there's a period of time during which everyone seems well, but the infection is circulating. And this has proven to be, I think, one of the most difficult. So it's not like the influenza where you start to cough and it coincides with your you know, higher rate of transmissibility or, or ability to infect others. And you can self-isolate because of course, that's what you would normally do. You would stay home from work. That's the thing that this particular organism has uh, introduced um, now, we have other instances of asymptomatic transmission. HIV AIDS was one of them, mm -hmm. um, but we're talking about a sexually transmitted uh, disease rather than a virus that's spread through the atmosphere. Mm -hmm. so, so I guess what I want to highlight is the way in which this COVID-19 is not just different in scope, and scale, but also in the particulars with regard to this uh, transmission story that accentuates the sociology of vulnerability. Mm -hmm. my, my fourth quick point, uh, one more minute. What? All right, so my fourth quick point is the kind of this, the, the way in which race and racialization can sometimes happen uh, often in this space. So you have, for instance, um, in the influenza pandemic, Alan was absolutely right that because there was a sense that we're all in this together and we're all equally vulnerable, right? It, it didn't lend itself to the same kind of stigmatization. On the other hand, you still find articles, uh, for instance, in an Atlanta newspaper that says the Negroes have not escaped the flu and a number of them have died in larger numbers. Then you have in Louisville articles that say the Negro race has seemed to be characteristically less susceptible. And then you have in St. Louis arguments that the proportion of deaths among whites and Negroes seems to be about the same, apparently refuting the theory that Negroes are immune. So even when we don't know, it generates these theories of racial difference. Last comment. Um, and, and they're about how epidemics accentuate disparities, not just reveal them. Um, and also the prominence of protests, dissatisfaction, blame, scapegoating of the kind that Alan described, uh, and also how epidemics can be wake up calls for social change of the kind that Sam just referenced. The color epidemics in the 1860s are a good example of the kind of the origin point of the creation of a modern public health system. And my la very last comment is about vaccines and how the vaccines, um, you know, in some ways, many of us see this as a way out of this calamity, but it's important to understand that vaccines can also become the basis of new kinds of inequalities as well. Because after all, we have to prioritize who gets them first. You don't hear anybody saying that prisoners who have been adversely affected disproportionately should get vaccines first. Um, their, the, where they fall will say a lot about how, a pen, how the vaccine will perpetuate and in fact, accentuate and create new disparities. So I'll, I'll stop there. There's more to say, but I sort of laid out enough for a further discussion. <clears throat> Thank you, Keith. Thank you, Keith. Lots to talk about. Uh, Mike. Hello, everyone. It's a pleasure to be here. Um, first of all, let me just say that 
it's an honor to present with all of you. Uh, what a brilliant, brilliant panel. Um, I'm the odd man here. I'm not a historian. I'm a social worker by vocation and training. Um, but a lot of my work uh, also incorporates a histor the historical context. Uh, besides uh, being a professor here at the School of Social Work, I'm also uh, the director for Native Hawaiian Pacific Islander and Oceania Affairs uh, with the Indigenous Wellness Research Institute. And um, I think my role here was as a discussant, but you know, after hearing everyone, I, I think that what I was hoping to talk about makes uh, fits right in and uh, perhaps even brings it brings it to a, a, a very local and a very uh, specific example. So, you know, I'll start by talking about um, the people of the Pacific or Pacifica. You know, most most of us know that as, as, as early as over 3000 years ago, um, there was a, a melding of people in Oceania uh, from Madagascar, from Africa, from Southeast Asia, uh, uh, immigrating to the continent of Australia and on and on through the Pacific and approximately 2000 years ago, even making it as far North as the Hawaiian islands. Um, one of the things that we're starting to learn now is that those journeys were not a one-time journey. It wasn't a, a mistaken, uh, you know, uh, landing, but it was actually, uh, you know, uh, a well-navigated and uh, a journey that was made multiple times back and forth throughout the Pacific and possibly beyond. Um, a lot of new unique cultures evolved along the way, as, as most of us know. And, and in 17, uh, 1778, uh, brought the uh, first uh, arrival of Captain James Cook to the Hawaiian Islands. And during that time, they estimated that the population of Hawaii was anywhere between 500,000 and a million. Um, now, that's a pretty wide range, but uh, we also know that, uh, you know, these individuals on Cook's uh, ship were, were quite adept at uh, estimating populations. Um, interestingly, by uh, 50 years post-contact, uh, at the first US uh, first census in the Hawaiian Islands, our population was noted as 39,000. Um, so that is a tremendous depopulation, uh, regardless of the upper end or lower end of the first estimate, um, to see such a large number of people die. Um, most of that was the result of the smallpox, uh, as well as some of the other infectious diseases uh, that were transmitted during those early years in terms of contact with Hawaii. And so as far as pandemics are concerned, uh, Pacific Islanders are, are, are very familiar with pandemics. Um, they not only uh, sort of are a significant part of our history, but um, I think that they, you know, it leaves a legacy of, of our colonization um, and uh, um, it continues on today. One of the reasons I chose this background uh, was because um, I, I, I view it as somewhat of a symbol. This is uh, taken at the island on the island of Kaho'olawe, which is one of the main nine islands in the Hawaiian chain, just off of Maui and Lanai, for those of you who, who kind of know the islands. Um, and this crater here is a, uh, is a result of a 500 megaton bomb uh, that was uh, used to simulate a nuclear explosion. And this is the impact of that on the island, which uh, destroyed the water table and has now made uh, our sacred island uh, inhabitable for, uh, for most of eternity. Um, however, uh, Native Hawaiian people have, uh, you know, have not only stopped the bombings by, uh, this was in the 70s, by uh, uh, protesting and occupying the island but have continued to engage in restoration efforts on that island to bring life back to the island, though it will never uh, be inhabitable because of the lack of water. Um, it, uh, it can still be restored uh, to the spirit uh, of, of which, you know, we, to the extent to which we have a relationship with this land and that we want to honor it and take care of it. Um, so, Bringing us back to today, um, 
in those states in which we have a significant population, uh, the Native Hawaiian Pacific Islander cases, hospitalization rates and death rates have been uh, the highest in our states. So in the state of Washington, we have had the highest rates. Um, nationally, our rates are very similar to other racial and ethnic minority groups, uh, including African Americans and Latinos. Um, and yet, because of the size of our group, you know, our, our, our concerns uh, are typically not heard um, as well. Um, and so one of the things that I think has been, you know, really, really wonderful besides, besides the, the threat to our community and uh, the triggers of historical trauma caused by a pandemic, um, I really feel like this pandemic has also triggered resilience um, our spirit of being able to rise above uh, some of the worst, you know, uh, case possibilities that could exist uh, with the first pandemic, with the smallpox pandemic, you know, and our survival, you know, today our numbers are close to back up to about 500,000 now. Uh, and so, you know, when you talk about a sense of resilience, we, we have seen that resilience. We've seen a rise in community engagement. We've seen a rise in new alliances created, not only within Pacific Islander groups, but also across communities of color. Uh, one of the most beautiful examples of this was, was our alliance with um, the Black Lives Movement here in the Pacific Northwest. Um, as most of you probably know, our, our communities were very responsive to the call for uh, uh, ending police violence and uh, police reform. Um, and uh, our communities were a part of that. Uh, and that's something that I, I, I had not seen prior, you know, uh, uh, a very, very strong alliance, a rise of, rise of new community organizations, uh, one in particular in King County um, that started about the time that the pandemic uh, blew up and uh, has been involved in providing PPE for the community, providing uh, food distribution, uh, uh, and also uh, providing uh, culturally targeted public health messages um, on wearing masks, on quarantining. We saw alliances with the LGBT community, which many people uh, may not know, but uh, is actually quite a very uh, strong uh, community within Pacific Islander, uh, uh, communities partially because of our uh, general acceptance of, of uh, gender fluidity. And so, you know, affectionately referred to as the queer trans Pacific Island community or the cutie pie community. Uh, <laughs> we created some regional alliances as well as national alliances with a group called Utopia, uh, who, uh, which is a, a group, uh, an LGBT Pacific Islander group. And then finally, we're also seeing a rise of, of Hawaiians, Samoans, and uh, the people of Guam, Chamorro people, uh, uh, being noted as indigenous. Uh, this is one of the uh, 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 first times that, that the US government has begun to recognize our groups as indigenous. Many people uh, may not realize, but Native Hawaiians are not, you know, we're considered an ethnic group. And we uh, currently are not uh, considered, uh, you know, by any treaties to be uh, 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 um, indigenous, um, distinct, an, a distinct indigenous group, regardless of the fact that we occupied the land that was taken from us and, and uh, um, has, has established uh, illegal government on top of our land. So, and I could go on and on about that, but I'm gonna uh, stop. And then, because I can go on and on and on, uh, but uh, I, I really want to hear what others have to say as well. So thank you. Thank you, Michael. Thank you. I appreciate that. Uh, so these rich, rich presentations, everyone, and uh, speaking to the the lots of the issues. So can we have some some comments first? Uh, I could jump in one, but uh, I want to let everybody else have a have a chance. Alan. Yeah, I'd like to respond to, to Keith because uh, such an interesting uh, concept, the sociology of vulnerability. Uh, and I think it's something uh, 
that I want to think about uh, for a long time. Uh, it certainly is applicable to some of the examples we've all used. I was thinking about the polio epidemic of the early 1950s, though. Uh, we haven't mentioned that this afternoon. Mm -hmm. And uh, for many of us, it was the first epidemic we encountered. I you know, got my shots in 1955. Uh, but I remember uh, the, the point that people made about the polio epidemic is that it crossed class lines. And the example that was often given was that of FDR. Um, but not just FDR, many other people of wealthy backgrounds and uh, socially prominent people whose children were as vulnerable as uh, the children uh, in inner cities in, in the Bronx where I grew up or uh, Newark or other places like that. Uh, and I'm wondering, um, Keith, if you might comment about so that issue. Uh, the, the sociology of vulnerability has to, has to be a flexible concept uh, right. to embrace something like that polio epidemic. So uh, this is, that's a great comment. And I have two observations about where polio fits. Uh, one is arguably a little spe uh, spe uh, speculative, but it has to do with the specific dynamics of the polio viruses. So, you know, one of the things we know is that polio becomes uh, epidemic in its form in the 1890s or so the first, first, but, but we, we also know that when, when, when infants are exposed to polio viruses, it manifests itself as a kind of a fever, a subclinical infection, and it, it, you become immune. It's, it's when society produces barriers to uh, routine exposure to polio virus for infants, as in higher standards of hygiene, sanitation, plumbing. Um, so in some ways, polio is a byproduct of the increasing levels of, um, of hygiene and sanitation and hand washing. And then when you become exposed to polio at age eight or nine, that's when you have infantile paralysis. Yes. So the story of polio isn't the same as let's say influenza because in some ways the polio viruses are, are kind of attuned to, to attacking people of a certain kinds of means if you know what I mean. Um, and then, uh, it, so the, the irony is that the, the stench and the filth and the horrible conditions of urban life in 19th century, horrible for cholera, no, actually so. fine for polio, <laughs> right? And if, if the polio viruses are around, it's everyone's becoming immune. It's when you create a population that isn't routinely exposed that you produce a new kind of uh, round of polio. And the irony is that we have vaccines to replicate what had been happening kind of organically. Um, the other problem with the story with polio, of course, is that <laughs> we think about the Salk vaccine and we think about him injecting himself and his kids. We don't think about the Walter E. Fernald School for the Mentally Retarded that were used as, uh, as part of the polio trials right. in developing the Salk vaccine. So, you know, there's these interesting understories of inequality as well. So that's how I would say it fits into the sociology of vulnerability, but it, every virus being a little different tells a different story. So I have a question that, that, that I think could be answered by, by, by any of you. Um, as historians uh, and a social worker, but with great historical sensibilities, um, you know we have these. We we know uh, we know a lot of these stories, and Keith, I thought it was great to point out that each organism, each virus, each bacteria tells us a different story. There's some commonalities. There's some differences. It highlights various aspects. But the thing that I'm struck by, and I have been ever since the begin last end of last February, I've been overcome with the sense of dread. I was waiting for the first article to say, it's here in the US, it's in communities of color, poor, vulnerable black and brown folks are gonna get sick because it was going to happen. 
from everything we know. And I think it was Alan who said, look at the failure of the CDC. If we knew that as historians, what was the problem for the CDC to immediately know this was going to spread to the most vulnerable populations and we need to be clear about that right now. How do we explain that? Um, well, I have one way to explain it, is the politics of the madness we've been involved in. But are there other sets of reasons why uh, those of us with a historical sensibility could see it and those who were policymakers either didn't see it or didn't want to do anything about it? Yeah. But my suspicion is that, um, that the field of epidemiology as it's practiced in Atlanta and outside of Washington might still be um, very much taken with uh, the kind of technologies of tracing a virus, as opposed to thinking about the social inequities that give it rise. Mm -hmm. Because yeah, and like this is, it was pretty clear cut, right? When like they told us immediately, yeah, there's, there's, there's four pre-existing conditions. And if you look at those four, they are in black communities in higher, you know, in elevated rates. Like someone should have said, hey, and by the way, all of you who live in black communities should probably be extra vigilant. Mm -hmm. um, that didn't happen. And I think it's because the CDC is not doing its job when it comes to social inequity. That's a suspicion. I, I've never worked for them. I know people who have, but I think that the evidence of that is the letter that came out on June 3rd, I think it was June 30th, it was late June, where those thousand, I think it was 1,007 employees all said there is not just current racism, but it goes way back. And I think that explains why I think there's just an institutional culture there where they just, they're not thinking like that. Mm -hmm. That's just, that's speculative. Mm -hmm. Mm -hmm. Yeah, I agree with that very much. I think there's a politics here and it's a complicated politics. It's partly uh, the, the routine traditional politics of uh, you know who's gonna take responsibility of this, which, which administration, who's gonna be tagged with responsibility for not blowing the whistle soon enough or for blowing it too soon. And then there's uh, an additional factor here. And that is, do you wanna be the one to single out any community as being especially vulnerable, even if the vulnerability is uh, sociologically based. And I think that politics weighed heavily here too. Mm -hmm. No one wanted to stand up and speak that truth mm -hmm. for fear that there would be a backlash against them, if not now, eventually. Mm -hmm. And so if you put the two together, those two political uh factors what you had is the perfect storm nobody speaking up nobody addressing uh the truth in that way and leave, in effect leaving uh these communities vulnerable very vulnerable mm -hmm. and unwarned in mm -hmm. any rational way so so alan yeah. when you say backlash i'm, I'm sorry i just went ahead of follow up but when you say backlash like from whom Oh, that, that's, I'm curious. Yeah, in other words, would communities have stood up and saying, you're singling us out. We are not more vulnerable. You may say we're more vulnerable, but we're not more vulnerable. Are you making a biological argument about us? Well, uh, I think, I, I mean, yeah, I, I, I certainly see that, but I think that's my point that it's not about the biology, but the structural vulnerability. And I think that's what, I don't know the exact, um, the etymology of this, of the sociology of vulnerability, Keith, you could tell us more about that. But when I think of like structural vulnerability as some, you know, medical anthropologists have used that we're thinking about not the biology, but you know, what, what forces are in play that create those vulnerabilities. So, I mean, again, we're kind of being counter historians at this point. And, you know, here, once you identify a vulnerability, don't you have the obligation to do something about it? Well, if you're is, working for a place like the CDC. Yeah, I think that's really what, I think once you open that can of worms, now you gotta, right. eat, you gotta eat those worms. And I think the CDC wasn't really willing. Yeah, anyway. Yeah. Let's let Keith jump in here. 
Yeah. So I, I, I'm, I'm watchful also of the uh, couple of questions that are piling up in the Q and A yeah. Uh, yeah. feed. The only thing I would say is that historically, um, you know, epidemics, we would like them to be not political, but they're always political. They, they always have, uh, and, and elected officials will make politics with the epidemic or the people affected will see the actions of elected officials politically. So back in the influenza pandemic, you know, you have protests against mask wearing uh, mandates, you have protests against the closing of theaters, mm -hmm. uh, you have the traditional tension between commerce, uh, claims about individual liberty, right, and excesses of government. Mm -hmm. You saw that in the cholera epidemics as well. So in some ways, I'm not surprised. And then the other is, you know, as Charles Rosenberg has often pointed out that, you know, in some ways, like the, the, pe the epidemic doesn't exist until people agree that it exists. And so you had this phenomenon back in April in which New Yorkers and people in New Jersey felt very, very certainly that this pandemic existed. But if you ask people in North Dakota, yeah. they said it's either one, a hoax, or it's two, it's not going to affect us, mm -hmm. or three. And this is very much the way Americans were in 1832, just yeah. before cholera breached the Atlantic uh, for the first time. They, they said, we are not going to be vulnerable to that disease that is finding root in these large, impoverished cities of Europe. So I feel like that feature of the psychology has always been part of epidemics. Mm -hmm. And what you saw in the case of is a kind of denial of reality as part of the strategy that and you can you, you sustain it as long as you can. Unfortunately, that's part of the logic of how the politics of pandemics sometimes uh, plays out. The last thing I'll say is that there's a little bit of a eugenic mindset here, right? Which is, you know, if this, and sadly, you saw this in Katrina, right? If this calamity ends up, you know, wiping out a certain subset of the population, then it was either meant to be or let us just let it I'm, I'm not accusing any one person of doing this but the effect of denialism right. is to allow the process to unfold and it's now we see the changed logic when it becomes clear that it's not just um people of color it's not right. just minorities uh so I, I do think that the the story of the minority calcul the minority feet face of the COVID-19 early on had this strange kind of racial effect across the country yes it, it, it certainly did and, and and I think we should turn to the chat but at the same time that part of the, the that racial effect it seems to me then got kind of a slight turn when it's when the focus came on mistrust of the vaccines. Mm -hmm. Here we already had many communities across the country who were completely uh, uh, protesting and resisting public health experts. But then the focus was on African Americans mistrust. Uh, and I thought there's so much mistrust here why is this kind of mis kind of mistrust being so heightened? Um, and uh, I think that and there's a there's a lot more to, to be said about that. But let me let me turn to the the chat. The first question um, uh, speaks to uh, a question um, about um, let's see uh, issues of structural uh, violence, uh, which we've talked a little bit about. Um, and how deliberate, the question is about how deliberate policy choices compound the structural violence of the pandemic. Um, and I think that, uh, again, uh, that's, a, that's a good question to toss over to Sam, but uh, also I, I still want us to hold on a little bit to this notion of you know, the way different viruses, bacteria, outbreaks, pandemics, shape this notion of structural violence as well. So Sam, what would, how would you answer 
or comment yeah. or comment about that? Yeah, I think that question comes from Beatrix Hoffman. Greetings, Beatrix. Uh, was hope, hoping to see you at this conference and at our other annual conference. You are one of many scholars that I've missed this year, so good to hear from you. Um, I would say, I think this is going back to what Alan just said about, you know, if you ask the question about why is it that you have certain communities with higher rates, unless you're willing to go and say, oh, it's for, you know, like to, if you're going to, if you want to make that eugenic reason that Keith, to which Keith just alluded and say, oh, it's just biology, you know, let, you know, let the chips fall where they're made. It automatically asks a question about why is that? And then you have to talk about what are the occupational structures that make people more vulnerable? What are some of the housing structures? You know, when people, you know, live in housing precarity. I live not far from Elmhurst, Queens, which was called the epicenter of the epicenter. And that's the area where it's, you know, a lot of people who work in high risk occupations, but who have low economic job and housing security. And so not surprisingly, we saw all that. But and the other thing that I that confounds me as well is that these don't come up in our discussions about the vaccine. The, when it comes to black people in the vaccine, like you said, Evelyn, it's always about, will they trust it? But no one's ever had that, uh, that honest conversation about why we should have enrolled in the clinical trials. Right. And why, because it just sounded like you just want to test it on black people, which you can understand why that sounds a little untrustworthy. Um, and then it's about, do they trust the vaccine itself without explaining why it is that we have these higher um, rates? Uh, Fauci you know, had did a famous appeal last week to his quote, African-American brothers and sisters, right. cringeworthy appeal. Yes. Um, but he's, and you know, he also appealed to people to join, black people to join the clinical trials. He's never really explained to us why. Like he, he's very cautious about having a structural analysis of race. And we see this in the ACIP as well. None of the ACIP's considerations seem to really take into account structural vulnerability. It's about who they deem more valuable to getting the economy back up. So, yeah. There's an aspect of it, that, that, uh, of, of the way the, um, both the pharmaceutical companies and uh, uh, Fauci and others began to talk about uh, really pushing for people of color, particularly African-American communities and, and others more that are vulnerable to join the trials. It walked a thin line of, around, there's a biological issue here and there's a social issue here. You're the ones, this group is suffering the most so they should be in front and therefore they need to get into the trials in order for them to be in front to get the vaccine itself. Uh, but nobody made the big argument about, well, how many vaccines actually uh, of, any, of any kind have actually showed any kind of racial ethnic disparity in application and effectiveness and efficacy. That just seemed to be pushed aside and it just really seemed to me, my position on this, uh, that they were in, that this is being a social argument that if you couldn't show that black people were in the trials, then you were going to exacerbate the large mistrust that black people have toward the whole system. And this is a way getting them into the trials was a way to stop to 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 build a certain kind of trust. Uh, and then to have the first vaccines be taken by African Americans, dean of the Morehouse Medical School, or a, a longtime nurse was to provide a particular kind of reassurance without the specificity of what the reassurance was supposed to do. And I, I think that's been kind of troubling as we go forward. Um, and then I think, uh, so that, that's the way I would, I would answer that. I, I agree with you, Sam. They're, I don't think they're good answers yet. And it's not clear to me why leaders took the position they did on uh, inclusion into the trials and now in the vaccine trials and now inclusion uh, language that's being used to encourage people to go ahead and take it quickly. Um, Michael. Um, you know, this, this actually does remind me of what was going on here in, in King County. You know, I think a lot of, a lot of uh, very, very, very early on, you know, when the vaccine was, was when vaccines were first being talked about and first being uh, tested in the community, you know, um, I think there was a, a very deliberate approach uh, in terms of approaching not only uh, 
our Native American community through the Indigenous Oneness Research Center, but also the Pacific Islander community through our community uh, 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 association. What was interesting though was, you know, I mean, the people who were sent to speak to us were people from the UW Medical School who were generally white men who uh, had no prior relationship with the community, who the community did not know, had ever seen. And they would approach us as faculty, uh, native faculty, uh, to approach our communities to engage them in discussion, you know? And, and you know, that just, I mean, it's, it's sort of like how this thing plays out on the ground, right? I mean, you have all of this structural racism, you have all this structural inequality, then you have, you know, this scenario here and our communities, I mean, they, they you know, I mean, that, they, that doesn't work, that, that will not fly. Uh, the first reaction will be resistance and uh, um, the first thought will be, how are you trying to hurt us? You know, not help us. And so, you know, when you have this sort of predominant attitude and, and then you have it being played out the way it's being played out because of the structural inequalities, you know, um, it, 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 it breeds for a lot of distrust, you know, and, and so the early recommendations were do not participate in clinical trials until we get to a minimum of stage three, um, where once the safety trials are, have been completed, and even then to, you know, proceed carefully. So, I mean, you know, the politics of all of this really just kind of like play themselves out in a way that almost forces us to be mistrustful. Mm. And, you know, I think the, you know, one thing I wanted to say earlier was, you know, and I, I'd, I'd like to know your thoughts on this, but I feel as though if we didn't have the pandemic, um, would George Floyd's murder have been as uh, alarming mm. to uh, not just populations of color. We feel every death. Mm -hmm. But, you know, the widespread response by white people across this country following George Floyd, I, 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 I cannot see how those two are not linked. Mm -hmm. um, I'm certain that you folks probably have thought about this maybe a little more than I, but, mm -hmm. but um, you know, just the rise in, in, in sort of the visibility of structural racism and then mm -hmm. this event taking place just put people over the edge, you know, and, and, and I think, you know, again, just kind of using my background as, as, as that metaphor, you know, I mean, there's a sense of resilience that came out of this that I don't want us to lose. Yeah. Uh, you know, uh, our communities are not better off because of this pandemic. We're not better off because of structural racism, but we're still here and we're still yeah. fighting. Yeah, I mean, it was, we could have an entirely different uh, conversation about this, the question that you raised about the intersections between the COVID-19 politics and George Floyd's yeah. murder. Um, but I also want to sort of second your point about resilience, because the key is that out of these uh, pandemic struggles comes different kinds of opportunities and possibilities for social change. I mean, in the, in the same way that like everyone has had to pivot to Zoom as, as a new mode of interaction, um, people have actually been creating uh, community and change. And the key is to make sure that those kinds of relationships um, are, 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 are sustained. So one of the things that I'm interested in is the recreation of a public health not only system, but a public health outlook. Uh, because one of the things that the pandemic has shown is not just these inequalities, but the impoverishment of a, of a, of a medical only system that right. doesn't actually really address the, the social determinants of health uh, and, and which we are now seeing manifest uh, in the kind of the disproportions um, and, and you're seeing activism around those issues. I'm also watchful that, um, yes. uh, not to jump in, but the uh, Hillary Smith's question I thought was a particularly interesting one yeah. and yes. Uh, yes. was about like something about uh, quoting Robbie Aronowitz that along the lines of uh, epidemics don't usually end in biological sense. Instead, we declare that they are over when people with means and power are no longer vulnerable to them. And 
asks whether we're going to see something like this with COVID as people get vaccinated. That is, people declare that this is over uh, because the people with means uh, and resources say so. Anyway, I thought it would be good to throw that out there because it, th that's a really, uh, really terrific question. I think it's an absolutely great question. So uh, who wants to jump in first, Alan? It happened in the 1920s. Uh, as you know, I I'm sure several of you know, there were cases uh, into 1922 that were still being um, declared and people were, were still sick. But what happened was those who were most active uh, in the mainstream of society, who had the means who had the visibility when they were no longer getting sick, then the pandemic was over. Mm -hmm. And I think that often happens. And I think it's going to happen here. In fact, I'm quite certain of it. Uh, and I think you can get a hint of it by the way people are lining up for, for this vaccine. Who's rushing to the front of the line? Uh, who's pushing their way to the front of the line. And I think we're going to see that more and more. Uh, and after all of these folks are vaccinated and all of them are back on Amtrak between Washington and New York or on the shuttle, you'll be damn sure that they're going to declare the pandemic over. The, the one thing I might add is that we don't know yet how long a vaccine will be protective. Um, there's a lot of evidence that suggests that this will be kind of like for the next number of years, like the influenza vaccine, in which case it may have an incredibly long tail. That is to say that the, the story of when it's declared to be over <laughs> might be a, 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 sl a, a, a lot more complicated, but I agree with Alan that, you know, the, the social dynamics will likely continue to be the same, which is um, it's over when certain people in the, the last comment I want to make is that we, we do have the benefit of a political change of government, right. which will change dramatically the narrative. I'm, I'm not saying wholesale, but you know, the narrative of complete denial that this is even worth talking about yes. is not going to be the story of 2021. Thank goodness. But I do yeah. think that we are a, a society that's structured uh, with so many, structured by so many inequalities. And if the opportunity to address those are not taken right now as a result of what's happening for the pandemic, then I agree with all of you that it's, we're still going to be seeing uh, um, uh, those with means and power uh, moving as if nothing, as if it's all over, and the poor and the vulnerable will still be struggling uh, with it. Will we have free vaccines forever? If every year is everybody, if, it, if it, it turns out to be more like influenza, are those shots going to be for free? Uh, or will we go back into a place where it costs money in a, play, in a time when we don't have uh, health insurance, and then people will do what they've done already? make choices about whether or not they should get a flu shot that costs money or, mm -hmm. or a COVID shot that costs money or putting food on the table. So I want this to be a moment where the inequalities that are accentuated and revealed by the pandemic are addressed seriously. Um, but I have to end on a note of skepticism. Keith, on the medical side, I seem to remember that uh, about seven years after the polio vaccines were first uh, given, there was a booster mm -hmm. uh, and that uh, children in the elementary schools and in, in the high schools uh, were all lined up and given that booster. That's so we may idea. see a situation like that. We mm -hmm. could easily see something like that, I think. Mm -hmm. Yeah. Mm -hmm. Well, my friends, we, we come to the end of our time and uh, I wanna thank you all for this really rich conversation. Everybody added something I think really uh, special uh, and some special insights to uh, this ongoing conversation. I do wish we had a lot more time and I hope we all have other opportunities to continue to talk about these issues.
unfortunately, we may have more opportunities <laughs> to come together to talk about these issues. So thank you very much. And I want to turn the, the uh, floor back over to uh, Debbie Doyle. Thank you, Evelyn. Thank you. Thank you very much, Evelyn. Thank you all. Thank you. Uh, that concludes our presentation. A recording of this webinar will be available on the AHA's YouTube channel soon, and you can review recordings of other virtual AHA events on that channel as well. Uh, don't miss our January session, which is a series of high profile events the week of January 4th during the time when our annual meeting would have taken place in Seattle. And I wanted to uh, once more thank our generous sponsors, the National Endowment for the Humanities, the Stanton Foundation, the History Channel, and Oxford University Press. Thanks to everyone who submitted, qu submitted questions. And finally, a special thanks to our panelists today. Have a good day. Thank you.